Ladies and gentlemen, how low can we go? Let's get down with the Strings and Things podcast. On this show, guitarists come by to change their strings, shoot the breeze, and play some music. Here to school us on some low end theory is bass player Jeremy Ness, who's recorded and performed with bands such as Moving Picture Show, Humble Lion, and High North, among others. This week, he's brought a Chapman stick to the show, a 10 or 12 string instrument that looks like a really wide and long fretboard for a guitar without the body. He'll tell our host, Patrick Grant, how he came to pick up the instrument, and they'll put their axes together for a lyrical and percussive duet. So let's hand this over to Patrick and see what's up. Hi, Jeremy. Hey, how's it going there, Patrick? How you been? Pretty good. I've known Jeremy for, we're in our fourth year. Something like that, Of making yeah. music together. How did I meet you exactly? I had moved back to New York uh, after living in L.A. for about 10 years and looking for odd things to do. And I came across um, Spectrum uh, down in Lower East Side uh, with Glenn Cornett. And he said, you got to check out this guy, Patrick Grant. And uh, he was doing this guitar orchestra, you know, kind of ensemble thing. and a Thing. Thing. And, uh, and I checked it out. And I was, just, you know, the Tilted Axes Project, which is uh, a lot of fun to be a part of. Uh, that's how we connected. Now, of course, we're going to be dealing in the wonderful world of audio. So tell us, or tell those who might not know, what is a Chapman stick? Well, a Chapman stick is uh, a 10 or 12 uh, string kind of tapping uh, guitar bass instrument. Um, it has uh, it covers uh, anywhere from four to five octaves across the neck. Uh, it's a long scale, 36 inches, um, and it was created, uh, invented by a fellow by the name of Emmett Chapman about 40 some odd years ago. Uh, he was a jazz guitarist and uh, an engineer by, by nature and just wanted to fiddle and really wanted to expand on a two-handed uh, technique. So uh, the Chapman stick is pretty much the first instrument that was specifically designed uh, for two-handed, uh, non-strumming, non-plucking type of playing. You know, it has a unique sound. It's really warm. Uh, it's because it's long scale. It's got really nice sustain. Mm -hmm. And uh, me being as a bass player, you know, it, it really appeals to, you know, really odd bass lines and, and especially for the kind of music that I really dig. You know, it uh, it just fits. Still goes up pretty high, though, if you want it to on the, the higher strings. Well, on the, the highest string, it goes up to a high D. And it goes down to, um, at least as far as the last fretted note at the very, very bottom would be a D. So you do get two octaves uh, on that uh, on am one I, string. Am I sort of into this D to... Yeah. So it does, it does kind of parallel a, a lot with the guitar uh, and also bass. I mean, a low uh, D on the, the middle string. I mean, one thing that's really different about the, uh, the stick versus any other instrument, of course, so you might see it on a war guitar or, or a touch guitar with 10 strings, but uh, the bass strings uh, are basically inverted fits from the inside out. Your lowest bass strings are actually in the middle of the neck as opposed to at the, the, the top of the neck. And then you work outwards. It's a lot of working out. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's consistently working out. I mean, when I when I wake up in the middle of the night, have you been I'm working out recently? Trying to, okay. trying to get back into it, but I spend more time doing uh, extracurricular things. Is it possible you just give us a a flourish of sorts, uh, just so we can at least hear the range that we're describing, as opposed to let's say like <laughs> slapping a bass? You actually, it's all about touch. You know, low D up an octave to. Another octave, that's already, you know, that particular range, and that already takes up half the neck, but you already have all of these other particular notes that, you know, that you can easily grab. But because it's inverted, um, as opposed to the, the guitar or the melody side, uh, where it has guitar strings, that's all in perfect fourths. So, I mean, you can easily play all, kind, all kinds of things like that. Um, but when you're talking about on the bass side, you know, the two-handed uh, kind of technique that you have with playing bass does lend itself to, you know, sim simply being that, two-handed. So, I mean, you know, things like that that, you know, can be really uh, accentuated, punctuated, uh, staccato, or if you want really kind of more legato on. You can definitely do slides, you can definitely do hammers. I mean, basically everything you could do on a bass and a guitar, it's just now you don't, have your right hand or your left hand 
doing what you would normally do on those instruments. You're now using both of your hands that can engage the instrument with at least three or four fingers per hand at the same time. If you're listening to this podcast, you'll see the pictures posted, but uh, but to describe it, it is a stick-like creature here. I mean, it has uh, 10 strings. It's about uh, four feet long, and uh, I can see clearly by looking at the strings that it is divided into the two halves that you just described. And it has a wide neck, almost like five inches across. It's almost like two strat necks uh, put together almost. Yeah. You know, when I first saw it, I, I was like, this looks like a, a board of wood uh, right from a picket fence or two by four. But uh, what kind of wood is that? This one is rosewood. It's actually the, out of the bunch of sticks that have been produced, I think they may have been like five or 6,000 produced over the last 40 years, something like that. Because I you know rosewood's often used for just, um, even on my um, guitar Yeah, you here. wouldn't want a whole guitar made out of uh, rosewood or bass for that matter because it ends up being very dense and very, very heavy. Mm. So I actually have one of the heavier sticks uh, that have been produced. Uh, how much does that weigh? Do you, do you know? Don't know the weight, but you know the one thing I do notice about, at least as far as this type of wood or something with bamboo or even the newer sticks that are made out of um, airplane grade aluminum, the rail boards, um, I like the sustain uh, and there's something more organic about the wood that, than I find with any of the maples or any of the other Brazilian hardwoods that have been produced. Well, you are horribly hunchback, so I figured it was pretty heavy. I got no, pretty I'm, good. No, I got no, great no, posture. No, I'm what just kidding, everybody. I'm, I'm just kidding. No, if, uh, <laughs> actually, he does have great posture, but the, the instrument, uh, the, that's probably a matter of knowing how to hold yourself when you perform. Well, being a bass player for 25 years, you know, I certainly went through that pattern of hunching over and and hurting my back and and definitely suffering some injuries from it. But, you know, uh, first come first, you know, you have to take care of yourself. And And we learn a few things. Yeah. That's one of the things I like about Tilted Axes is through a lot of the, some of the techniques of the Alexander techniques that have been learned. I'm always curious about the Alexander technique, but, you know, just managing to getting around to being a part of a, a program. I, I, well, I find it really useful because I know that when we, when we do some of these tilts that um, I always crack up because some of the younger players are just are crippled afterwards. But it's like because they don't know how to hold themselves. And so they're, they're also not used to it. You, you, doing a, a tilted axis event, you really actually have to have some stamina to like walk the streets. Especially, I mean, guitars, I think, have it a lot easier. But I mean, for me, you know, when you know, one of the things about a stick is that you don't have a strap. Uh, it's mm-hmm. not strapped to your body and hanging off of your shoulders and your shoulders bearing the weight. With a stick, you actually have, there's a, a belt hook in the back of the body that is made out of uh, molded plastic that you can insert into your pants uh, mm-hmm. and your belt. Uh, I wear a... Um, I thought you were just happy to see me. Oh, yeah, yeah always, always. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I wear, I wear a belt around my waist. Not, I think it's actually a SWAT uh, attack belt but it's mm-hmm. made out of velcro and it's really really sturdy doing a tilted axis event and walking down the street and being you know especially in new york watching out for scaffolding and my instrument actually sometimes depending on how i position it might stand six inches above my head right so hitting you know scaffolding or uh, fire hydrants or pedestrians i mean or other guitarists in your own ensemble exactly yeah. so being on stage and not having to move anywhere is probably the safest place for me to be uh, when i have my instrument on so I'm glad to hear that. So Tilted Axis, to be a part, it is a dangerous proposition. It is a dangerous place. Ah, very cool. But, uh, you know, other accoutrements in the instrument. I mean, much of, much of what you see on the instrument, everything has been patented. Emmett Chapman patented pretty much everything except for, you know, the tuners are goto. Um, but they have, um, you know, little things like um, there's a, a bridge at, the, uh, at the, the far bottom end and then, of course, the, the pickups. And then there's what's called flaps uh, at the very top where the nut would be. And, and there are two uh, segments that are uh, bolted into the board. And you can, you know, basically raise them uh, almost like think of them as airplane wings. I think that's probably where they got the, the name flaps from like an airplane, mm-hmm. how you can tilt your wings. So you can actually adjust the action because on a stick, you know, as opposed to any other instrument, the neck really requires it to be uh, ultra flat has to be really straight. Mm-hmm. That way, you have adjustments on both ends of the body, so that way you can guarantee, uh, you know, as much, uh, or I should say, as little contact, but being as close to the the frets as possible, so you can get the best uh, sound. Okay. Well, for those of you who've been listening along, um, I think I've been through just about every guitar that uh, I have. So you I'll have be re- some nice guitars. Well, they're, they're okay. I'll be returning to my uh, Fender Jaguar. With the burgundy mist. Don't you have that one in two different colors? I do have this one you in two different colors. You have the tilted colors. blue, and then you have uh, this particular the one. Seafoam green. This one, I just uh, spent a week in Seattle doing a lot of recording every day. So its strings really do need to be changed. So 
only I will be changing my strings today because that's one more thing we can say about the Chapman stick. It doesn't need to have its strings changed that much. As, I used to change them, you know, religiously uh, around my birthday at the end of the year because it was just like, okay, it's another year started with a fresh uh, set of strings. I mean, it's long scale, so you never there's not enough high enough tension to really break a string. I mean, if you do, you're really you must might be doing something wrong. I haven't changed my strings easily in almost two years, so I just am not. I love the sound now because it's there. You know, you get your dirt in there, you get your your your, your essence into the strings. So I'm not really you don't change the strings on your piano all too often. So I'll be the only one changing my strings today. So let me get to it then, and we can continue our conversation. Great. I'm going to begin here by taking off the rather, rather crusty set of uh, you know, strings. I mean, I was saying before, you know, I, I change the strings, you know, very, I mean, not very often any longer because, you know, what I would always like to do is like, you know, polish it and I would sand some of the, the neck and smooth it out and, mm -hmm. then, you know, Stick Enterprises, uh, Emmett, he, you know, every single stick before it leaves the, the shop, he pretty much has his hands on it before it goes in the case and gets packed up. So you always have him, you know, you know that he always had, you always have his kind of sign off on it. What's their website? Stick.com. There you go. They have this really amazing uh, wood polish that they use. And every stick player who's owned a, a wood stick knows the smell. When mm -hmm. you open up the case, it, it, the smell lingers for, for quite some time, but it's such a amazing, you know, it's like so organic and such a great smell. Oh, I love that. Not that I'm huffing my stick. Right, but, but it's uh, like that new car smell or something. Yeah, yeah. it's something about it. So I, I, I picked up a can of that, and every single time I, I change the, the strings, I, I polish it, sand it, and give it a little bit of love. Where might somebody have uh, heard a stick before? Any famous recordings, or what would you say? Well, you know, I mean, I grew up listening to, you know, the, the typical prog bands, Genesis, Yes, Crimson, etc., but, you know, I think, you know, for those listeners who know King Crimson uh, inside and out, you know, know what I'm talking about. I mean, the first few opening moments of Elephant Talk on uh, King Crimson's Discipline album, still to this day, Tony Levin's performance on uh, that track is, I, at least in my opinion, probably the most critical for the instrument, but also the most famous. That was the first time I was uh, acquainted with the stick, too, it was um, there was a... TV show that was a knockoff of Saturday Night Live. Oh, the Friday, Fridays. the Friday, yeah, 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 yeah And they yeah. had great bands on. They had 1981's King Crimson. That was a U.S. Was that a U.S. show? Wasn't it? That was a uh, ABC Channel Seven. Yeah. That was ABC. That was probably like their first real like exposure, uh, at least with that with the the In quartet, the, US. the quartet lineup. Yes. Some of my biggest influences, of course, Adrian Blue and uh, and Tony. And that's Tony Levin. Yeah, he's, he's sort of the you know at least for stick players, he's kind of the gateway drug. And he came to New York City as a bass player, and he played on a lot of stuff. Somebody said he's the most recorded bass player. Well, I actually uh, listened to John Lennon's last interview, so that was in uh, late 1980, and he was talking about the people playing on the album. He's like, oh, and we have Tony Levine on bass. <laughs> so I don't know well, how well he knew his backing musicians, but uh, yeah, but Tony plays on that album too as a bass player. So King Crimson of that era, and of course, um, getting into the 80s, I'm sure... A lot of people will hear it on um, those very popular recordings that Peter Gabriel made. Peter Gabriel, for me, was probably my biggest musical influence, you know, between Genesis and, and just solo stuff. I mean, uh, one of my buddies online had asked, you know, what was, you know, a, a tape or a CD that you wore out the most? And for me, you know, when I first heard uh, Peter Gabriel's So back in 86, mm -hmm. that was probably the most influential album for me. And I probably owned three or four copies of the cassette just wearing it out, getting it eaten up or stretched or whatever. Getting... Of the what? The cassette? Yeah, yeah, right? Cassette. I just dated myself. That being, you know, that said, you know, the, the whole string of those early Peter Gabriel albums were, you know, albums that probably got the most visibility for the instrument, uh, especially between tours and videos and whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, nowadays, I mean, there's a whole crop of um, stick players that have been you know, who are incredibly well-known within the stick community and have been there ever since the beginning. And especially if you're a younger player, you just grew up into a world that was just full of stick players. Mm. So, yeah, it wasn't a, like, a, hey, what is that thing? Exactly. 
But when Peter Gabriel came out with his solo albums, uh, especially Games Without Frontiers, that really caught my ear because I thought that that was really doing some cool stuff. Because it's like, oh, is it like 70s rock? Is it, uh, is it new wave? Because I mean, because being on the cutting edge of uh, technology, a lot of the equipment that they were using, you know, was just, you know, the same as you'd find on any avant garde album of the time. So he was definitely, you know, not the only forward thinking player of the time. And there's certainly, you know, multitudes of players. And you can argue, you know, to your, you know, content as to who's the most influential. But I think for me, having that exposure to things like world music and, and drumming and African drumming and, mm -hmm. and, and different sounds and textures that weren't prominent in other music. I mean, maybe Paul Simon's Graceland at the time and maybe some of the stuff that Talking Heads were doing. But I think all of those things, you know, all the polyrhythms and the textures and, you know, all the things that I was consuming. Then again, I was also a child of the 80s, so I loved anything in all cheesy one-hit wonder 80s music. I mean, I grew up listening to also Z100, you know, sure. here in the New York area. Anything and everything. I remember hearing, you know, lots of Duran Duran songs when they were first uh, debuted. Great funk bass playing for a lot of white folks who didn't know what funk bass exactly. playing was. Yeah. The Buggles, all that stuff, Thompson Twins. I'm, I'm, name, I'm really dating myself, but I can name better 80s bands than the Thompson Twins, though. I saw them live. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have history with um, a bunch of those bands. Yeah, well, I saw them live before they were a big hit. So, you know, before MTV, you know, really. So, I mean, I know you, I know you love Devo. Yes. You have a Devo hat, don't you? It's an energy dome. But yes, I do. <laughs> Where were you born? Born in New Hyde Park, New York. Oh, really? Okay. I was definitely uh, a Long Island boy, but not uh, not uh, Suffolk County. No, I can tell. You know, you, you have that like on the border accent. You, you, I, you, I, you did I, say I, Long Island, not Long Island. Yes. So. Well, you know, living on the West Coast for for a number of years, that was definitely one of the things I wanted to do first was really shave a lot of my New York accent off. Think about pronunciation. Don't rush through sentences. I mean, I still, you can hear it when I get frustrated, mm -hmm. and you can certainly hear it when I'm ordering pizza. Well, you've been with me when I've been uh, in my hometown of Detroit, and a lot of my pronunciation falls back, too. It's oh, yeah, like, you, you, know, you, you go back to your default position. Do you have any milk for that coffee? <laughs> you know, that, that kind of stuff. But um, what is the first piece of music you remember really grabbing you? I owe my father a lot in exposing me to music. My father had an incredibly vast vinyl collection. So even from the day... Well, that's all they had back exactly. then. Exactly. Well, no, my father actually had eight tracks and he had uh, reel-to-reel, -reel. he had quarter-inch reels and things like that. So my father really, he had a nice... Uh, Anybody who had a quarter-inch reel-to-reel, -reel, we said like, there's an audio. Yeah, file. my father, he, he had a really nice stereo and it was like one of those things that were like bigger than like a, a toolbox. I mean, it was just a, a monster of a, a system. Right. But, you know, from the day that I was brought home from, you know, as an infant, you know, my father ex kept exposing me to, you know, everything from the Beatles to the Doors to Bob Dylan to, uh, you know, you name it. I can't remember if it was a specific Beatles song, but I know for a fact that it was a Beatles song. What was the first piece of music you heard that made you say, hey, I can do that? I didn't really start getting serious about music until I was like 17. Mm -hmm. My folks... They tried to get me involved in piano, and I tried to do all kinds of things. I even once upon a time said, oh, I'm going to learn the flute. Maybe that stemmed from my interest of uh, Peter Gabriel in Genesis. Uh, maybe that might have been the mm -hmm. impetus for that. Once I discovered, you know, my father's record collection, and I would, like, you know, go down into his uh, studio, into his, uh, into his office there, and I'd grab, like, a couple dozen albums, and I'd run upstairs to my room and just for hours on end and just listen to things. So mm -hmm. it was probably, you know, could have been The Who. It could have been, you know, anything like that. But I remember, you know, at some point I was like, okay, there's a guitar hiding somewhere in the attic. Mm -hmm. I need to start figuring out how to, to use that thing because... As I was getting older into my teens, I'm like, I know it's going to be a great way to get dates. <laughs> my family always had like, you know, uh, dad has a lot of guitarist buddies and Magnus chord organs and that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I had that, but I started taking um, piano lessons proper when I was 11 or 12 and violin and viola. I just jumped right in. Just boom. That's, that's, this is what I want to do. And I was writing, you know, started writing at an early age, but it got to a point 
where I was like, I too was listening to the Beatles in like eighth or ninth grade. And I thought like, oh, I can, I had friends writing songs. And I was like, wow, this seems to be like a better way to get an audience and especially girls interested in what I was doing than, than that. So I think that we're not pioneers in this regard. No, no, no not definitely not. I mean, I think I probably would have taken it more seriously if I had better teachers. I think the teacher, the, the ones, you know, it's one thing to have inspiration from music that you enjoy, but I think those mm -hmm. people that you learn from teaching, teaching wise, as a teacher, you have to inspire, you know, your students. I just was not inspired by the people that would come, you know, every week, you know, and sit mm -hmm. in my living room with me and try to teach me songs that I'm like, I don't know the song. I don't know. It just didn't. It didn't uh, gel with me because should you play the song first to demonstrate it? And you know, and we, so I think. And we were too young to say, "Hey, I'm not feeling this." You yeah. Know? yeah. We thought, okay, I don't know anything, so but this is boring. But okay. I mean, I love classical music, but if somebody had played me a recording or demonstrated mm. it somehow and said, "This is what you're supposed to do," now you can try and you know pick out the notes and try to do it, as opposed to putting a sheet a piece of sheet. Otherwise, music like front. connect the dots, like yeah, connect the like, dots and uh, find um, out what the picture is. I like, have no idea what it is, yeah. and I think that that was very. Uh, it didn't gel with me, and it was very disconcerting. And you know, until I actually started to show an interest in really listening to music, was when I said, "That's when I can start really playing and, and really approach it." It's always something to be learned and noodling. What's nice about this stick, you're always playing at least two or three strings at the same time. At least two out of the three are either right or wrong. So at least you got one note that's right. Well, maybe that explains a lot of, a lot of the stick music I hear. <laughs> this is modern composition. It's like, no, we're just... <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of great stick players out there, and you know, there's a lot of um, soloists, stick soloists. Uh, I've always considered myself a part of the band, you know, especially being a bass player. It's like, you know, I'd rather be a part of the band mm -hmm. instead of uh, playing by myself. So I'm not really a, a, a composer. I don't compose solo pieces. I'm always thinking in terms of parts and how they relate to mm -hmm. uh, other pieces. Earlier last month, I mean, I, I go to an annual uh, band camp up in Woodstock that's hosted by members of uh, King Crimson, Tony Levin and Pat Mastelato and Adrian Ballou. This is the three, the three of, of a perfect pair camp. And uh, this year, uh, this was my third year going in, and uh, a bunch of friends and myself, we uh, opted to put together a quote unquote band camp band. And so there was an ensemble of about eight of us, eight, nine of us. We were all working remotely on uh, a number of different pieces, but it was kind of exciting that, you know, going into it, you know, with my method and how I try to, you know, you've, you've seen me do it for Tilted Axes. I mean, right. I'm, I'm the only person not playing a guitar, so I have to come up with things that are you know, particularly different, that hopefully fit mm -hmm. uh, the whole scheme. But it was kind of nice to like go into, we went to uh, um, Kingston, New York a few days before camp started, a bunch of us, and we were in a rehearsal studio and, uh, you know, it was just exciting to see that all my work really did fit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so thinking about the stick, you know, compositionally or thinking about it as a, as a lead player, like a guitar player or a bass player. So there's so many different ways that, you know, stick players or war guitar players or even touch guitar players, you know, we all can play various parts uh, of a band. Well, having worked with you uh, live and in the studio, I can vouch that that's exactly what you do and you do it well. Thank you. What other kind of things uh, interest you? What other skills do you have that uh, make up your day? Well, I have two children. My daughter was born six months ago, mm -hmm. and my son is seven. And one of the things outside of music that I enjoy doing is crafts and making things and building things. And, you know, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, I could see, you know, odds and ends and recycling and garbage and, and you know, build. Uh, we Last year, we built uh, a praying mantis out of wire hangers, toilet paper rolls and uh, Easter eggs, like That's plastic cool. Easter eggs and just a little bit of hot glue and spray paint and 
because he was all of a sudden interested, my son was interested in uh, praying mantis uh, insects. I like building and creating, I, so I like projects. You know, I, I don't care what it is. I mean, I, I could you know, build something at home or I could assemble something. I mean, just being busy in that way, I, I think, is, uh, is ideal for me. Well, it's cool having a dad who does that, seeing how many toys were available for kids. Like if a superhero film comes out, all the toys are there, or, or if a Star Wars comes out, all the toys are there. But I remember that they didn't have a lot of toys when I was a kid that was associated with things like that. So if I, I saw the movie 2001, so I actually like made models of those spaceships <laughs> nice. out of white shirt cardboards my stepfather had. If there's something you wanted to play with, I'd have to make it, you know? My grandpa thought I was a little um, twisted because I was always making dolls or like we call them action figures these days because they didn't have like Spider-Man or, you know, or any of those characters. But um, but I know how to like sew little costumes like now here's this arch villain Mysterio. Like where are you going to find a Mysterio, you know? But making stuff uh, is a fantastic thing because that's going to carry over into so many other aspects of a kid's life. Well, I think it, it, it kind of defines me as just like trying to manifest something out of nothing. And I think that, you know, that's something that I've always tried to do because I came from a middle class family, so I, had, I didn't do without. But mm-hmm. I also, you know, was left to my own devices because I was an only child. So I was like, how do I entertain myself? How do I do and create? Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's of my very essence. I think that that's uh, one form of parenting that doesn't exist enough anymore. It's like, you go find something to do. We don't, we're not here to entertain you. We're doing our own things. And I got to break my son out of Minecraft. He, he discovered Minecraft with all the kids at school. And last year it was uh, Pokemon cards, of course. That's, right. still, that's still around. But I think now I got to actually build a Minecraft fort or something at yeah. home out of cardboard boxes. And I'm going to have to do that. Getting back to the music, what uh, things are, are you up to currently? Actually kind of free at the moment, which is actually kind of nice. I mean, the summer was... Uh, oh, that's why you said I'll be right over when I called you. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> okay. I set a bunch of goals for myself musically and performance-wise that I, that I, that I managed to meet all the, the goals that I set for myself for camp. And even though I may not be busy with a band and I'm playing with a few people here and there and mm-hmm. trying to explore and, and see things uh, that might come to something... But I'm also happy that I get to spend a lot of time with myself and working on what I feel that I need to be doing to to make myself a better player. That's something that I think I'm very blessed in being able to play this instrument is there's always something new to see. There's always something, you know, I'm always looking for those aha kind of moments. Right. And and that's really what, uh, you know, I'm spending my time doing these days. I would say that um, doing a quick check here, see how much they've gone out of tune. Not so bad. Well, how would you feel about suiting up? And um, we'll put together a little um, piece of audio magic to be the cherry on top of the ice cream sundae that is this podcast. Absolutely. Sounds cool.
Thanks a lot. That was pretty cool. Thank you so much for having me today. I was, I was glad to be able to talk about you know my instrument and some of the interests that I have. If people want to find out more about you and your work, where should they go uh, online? Not hard to find. Uh, I have uh, presence on uh, a variety of different websites, whether Reverb Nation, etc. Whatever I do manage to, to find, videos and, and snippets here and there, I do try to post. So there's stuff to be found. Do a search on Jeremy Ness. That's Ness. N E double S E. <laughs> well, thanks for being on the show, man. Absolutely. Thanks so much. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. Our guest has been Jeremy Ness. And you can find out more about him on Facebook at Jeremy Ness Music. That's Jeremy N E S S E Music. Special thanks to Vox Amps USA, the Dario Strings, and Electro Harmonics New York City. I'm Jocelyn Gonzalez on the Zeros and Ones. And Patrick Grant is our host and axe wrangler. Strings and Things is a Pepper Green production for Headstepper Media. Visit our website at stringsandthingsshow.com. See you next time. <laughs>